All right, Psalm 14. Of course, very, very, very famous passage here. And Psalm 14 is, is almost identical to Psalm 53. You'll see the same, virtually the same psalm. Now, there are some differences, and I think by the time I get to Psalm 53, I'm going to go more in depth on just a few of the differences in the verses. They're right near the end of, uh, of both of them. I'm not going to spend time getting that tonight, but if you want to go home later on tonight and read Psalm 53 and just kind of compare the two, uh, you'll be able to see that almost, almost word for word they're identical. But Psalm 14, verse number 1, the Bible reads, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Now, we have, this is, what this is talking about, this person who says there is no God, is talking about the atheist, right? Where the atheist is someone who, who believes that there is no God, that we just happen to get here by chance, that the earth is millions and billions of years old, and nothing blew up and created everything, and everything just happened by chance, and it just so happened that this planet out of all the other planets, just seem to be able to be uh, conducive for life. And life just kind of appeared out of nowhere and that things came together and it's just magical thing happened and then lightning struck and, and there was water and, 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 you know, this stuff just appeared and all of a sudden there's life. And, and over time, this, this life that was just miraculously created, somehow was able to regenerate and reproduce and continue on and survive and, and, and transform into all various forms of life that you see today from plants and animals and insects and fish and birds and everything that we have today all just came from nothing. And if you're scratching your head thinking, what a stupid thought, well, you agree with the Bible because the Bible says that the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And when there is no God, you've got a lot of explaining to do on the way that everything is designed. Now, I really wish I would have copied some of the quotes that I saw um, from the big named atheists that are out there today. You know, we have, of course, Stephen Hawking. Who, who just died this year and went to hell and is literally burning in hell as we speak right now under our feet and is probably hoping that people can hear this message and actually listen. If he could come back, he would probably tell everybody, I was a fool. God exists. God is real. Hell is real. And you ought to believe on Jesus Christ and avoid this place of torture and torment. Because it's the fool that said in his heart there is no God. Stephen Hawking, Richard Dawkins, all these famous atheists, right? These, these so-called great, just, just great brains and great minds of the world that are so smart. They're so smart they can't even understand the most basic, simple principle that God is real and he's created everything. They're fools. The Bible says they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. These atheists, they are corrupt. They do abominable works, and there is none that doeth good. Turn, if you would, real quick to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And these people always want to sound real smart and say, well... The probability that God exists is very, very, very small. It's almost insignificant and that it's very unlikely that God actually does exist. And people will look to these fools and be like, oh, wow, they're so smart. They must know what they're talking about. And they're actually just complete imbeciles. They're fools. Romans chapter 1, God gives us plenty of reason and evidence to believe. Now, What's interesting is when you talk to people that say, well, I always have a problem with blind faith. Blind faith, as if, as if there is no reason or any type of logic at all involved in believing in a God. That it's just completely blind. Like there is just nothing that we could say 
that would show any type of reasonable evidence to say that God exists. It's just, oh, it's just blind faith. Oh, you just, you just need to feel good about yourself, so you need a fairy tale that's going to make you feel better. That, that's what these God-hating atheists will try to tell you is that, oh, I'm so much stronger than you, and it's the pride. The pride that comes out of the atheist is absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. They look down on other people. They look down on people as being idiots, as being stupid, as being inferior, as being intellectually inferior because you believe in God. And they think, oh, well, you just need that crutch. You just need some figment of your imagination to help explain things that you don't understand. And that's the way that they want to perceive believers because the alternative would make them look foolish and stupid, which is what they are. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1 that we all are without excuse, that God gives us plenty of information and evidence to know that he exists. Look at verse number 19. The Bible reads, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Man is without excuse today because God's eternal power and Godhead is evident and is understood by the things that are made. We are made by God. We are God's creation. So we have an understanding. God has given us the understanding that he has made all things. And he's also provided the evidence for that. The Bible says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Why, was their, why is their heart foolish? Because they, they, when they knew God, they rejected God. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. When they knew God, when they knew the gift of salvation, when they knew who the Lord is, when they knew that there's a Creator, they rejected Him. And their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Have you ever met an atheist that does not profess themselves to be wise? Because I haven't. The atheists are full of themselves. They do not have the humility that Christianity teaches. They don't have the humility that God tells us that we need to have. No, they profess themselves to be wise. They think they're so smart. They're smarter than everyone else. And if you believe in God, see, they say that, that we're the fools. Believing in some mythology or made-up creature. But the Bible calls them fools. They become fools and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. These atheists have a very strong tendency to also be earth worshipers. They worship the earth. They worship Mother Nature. They, they're, they're really big into the, you know, save the planet and stuff. Now look, I am not advocating just destruction and you know total pollution and just just wasting everything but at the same time when you look at what the uh, the push from the liberal save the world people it has nothing to, it, it has more to do with worshiping the creation instead of allowing for the dominion that God has given unto man over the world, over the earth, over the animals, over the creatures, and over everything to be able to use resources that are going to benefit us. Why? Because we matter more than the animals do. We matter more than the plants do. People, God has put a special price on, and God has made man in the image of God. He did not make the whales in the image of God. And he also, God has also already promised us that things are going to continue until the Son of Man comes anyway. So um, we don't need to worry that 
oh, we're using too many fossil fuels or whatever because we're not going to destroy this world before Jesus Christ comes back. That's a fact. But what we find is a lot of, where the Bible says here, they, they change the glory of the, the uncorruptible God in your image made like the corruptible man. That's your man worship, right? That's the, your humanist. The one that just believes in, you know, to the extreme of just, basically you become your own God. And you're the God of your own world. And this elevation of, of human beings, that maybe that has become their idol, that has become their image, or the earth, or birds, or animals. And basically just worship of the creation. And you will find that atheists will fit this bill in so many regards. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Bible tells us the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. That's why we call April 1st National Atheist Day. Because it's April Fool's Day. National Atheist Day. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Look what the Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Verse number 18, the Bible reads, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. To the unsaved world, to the unbelieving world, to the world that, that doesn't even want to believe in a God, the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the Bible, the preaching of Jesus Christ, to them, that's foolishness. Say, why are you wasting your time? You're a fool. You're believing in a fairy tale. That's what they think. That's what the world thinks. That's what the preaching of the cross is to them that perish. When it says they perish, it means they're going to die and go to hell. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So in this world, you have the wisdom of the wise, these, these great minds that the world wants to exalt, these atheistic minds that the world has so much regard for and so much respect for, spouting off their foolishness. The Bible says that God is going to destroy that wisdom. He's going to bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now catch that. Let's read this verse again. I want you to think about this verse. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. So this is talking about the, world, the wisdom of the world. By, by the world's wisdom, they chose not to know God because they think that it's foolishness. So in the world's wisdom, they knew not God here, I mean, think about this. You have God in heaven looking down at his creation. God doesn't have to wonder if God exists. God knows he exists, of course. God is up in heaven. He's looking down at his creation, the beings that he's created, the information that he's given us, everything around us that we have. Think about this now. And I've talked, about, I've talked to a few atheists out soul winning, ones who actually would be willing to have an intelligent conversation with me. And of course I give them some scripture, but I also usually try to get down to the foolishness of their evolutionary thought, of their, their belief in a religion of evolution. And I try to, to show them and say, hey, science is great. Why don't you actually use some real science and study the way things are right now? And when you study the way things are right now, you cannot come up with a feasible solution as to how everything became the way it is today. It's impossible. There are too many symbiotic relationships, and symbiotic relationships means 
that there are creatures that depend on one another existing at the same time in the same place in order for them to continue to survive. Now, there's not only symbi symbiotic relationships between two things, but overall, as a whole, in order for this world to have developed with everything coming into place in its proper time in order to support the life and the oxygen and the carbon dioxide and everything that happened, it does not just happen slowly over time. It cannot. It cannot. It's foolishness to think that it can. When you actually start studying real science and biology and you understand the way things work and the intricate design and what blows me away when I read these quotes is that they still use the word design. Wow, that's an interesting design. And it's like it goes right over their head that they're using language that supposedly they don't believe in. Because they don't believe there's a design. They think it's all random and it's all by chance and that the lucky thing that just didn't happen to die is the strongest thing and the best thing that will continue. And that there's just random mutations that sometimes will just make things better and better and better and, and, and creatures just continue to get new features that they've never had before. And it just happens out of nowhere. It just happens as a mutation. Like the creatures that, that began as a single-celled organism that all of a sudden developed eyes and fingers and ears and noses and just, it just came out of nowhere. It's ridiculous. What about having to have grass and trees? What about the, bird, the, the, the birds and the bees that are required to pollinate the plants? to cross-pollinate, to get things to grow? What about all of the various requirements in order for so many different forms of life in order to exist that are reliant on other external portions of, the, of their environment, of their ecosystem? And you look at the balance of the ecosystem and how incredibly balanced everything is, but you're going to tell me and expect me to believe that we have this real fragile balance that supports all of the life on this planet, but that it all was just thrown in there over time, a little bit here and a little bit there. Nonsense. Foolishness. But that is what people are willing to resort to when they simply don't want to accept that there is God because they don't like Him or they don't like the consequences of the fact that there is a God. They don't like the fact that they may be held responsible for their own actions on this world and have to face a judge, a God, that's going to tell them, no, you're wrong. And as a spoiled brat, they don't want to think that they're wrong. They're so puffed up in their own vain mind that they don't want to think that they could ever do anything wrong. That is the mind of the atheist. Forgot what verse we left off on now. We're in 1 Corinthians 1. Oh, yeah. So we have, verse number 21, we have God in heaven looking down at his creation. He knows he exists, and he looks at his own creation going, how could you not even understand that I exist, or it's, it's not that they don't understand, because they do. It's that they make the choice to say in their heart that there is no God. And God just says, wow, you're such a fool. So here's what he does, because he knows that there's people out there that just don't want to accept that he's real, that he exists. He says, the, the world, by wisdom, knew not God. Because they think they're so smart, they're like, oh yeah, we're so smart, we think there actually isn't any God. So what he does, it says it pleased God. So God is actually enjoying and is happy. And it says it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. To take the very thing that the, wor the world thinks they're so smart and God doesn't exist, right? And oh, you're so foolish to, to actually preach 
from some, for some deity that doesn't exist. And he says, you know what? That's exactly what I'm going to use to get people saved. And that forces them, if they are going to get saved, it's going to force them to realize that they're the foolish ones and God is not foolish and that the preaching of the cross is not foolishness and they have to repent and change their mind and believe and humble themselves and understand that God is Lord, that God is the God of everything and that they need to humi humble themselves and get on their knees and ask to be forgiven. Now, someone's going to take that clip and say, oh, Pastor Berger thinks you have to get on your knees in order to be saved. But I love here getting an insight into God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Verse number 22, for the Jews require a sign. See, the Jews can't just believe. That's their problem. They say, nope, we got to see a sign. We got to see something else. That's why they're always saying to Jesus, well, what sign do you do? What sign? You know, Moses gave us manna. What sign do you have? And he says, Moses didn't give you that manna. God from heaven gave that manna to you. That wasn't Moses. And he says, I'm the, I'm the bread from, of heaven. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. But the Jews want to see a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Greeks always think that they're so smart. And of course, they have their polytheism and all their Greek gods that they believe in, but they seek after wisdom. But we, those of us that believe, we preach Christ crucified. We don't need the sign, and we don't need the world's wisdom we just need Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. So the Greeks are seeking after wisdom and they think it's foolishness to preach of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 24, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. God takes the foolishness of preaching and he says, that's way wiser than the so-called wise men of the earth this, on, in any day. What the world thinks is wise is foolishness. And it's, it's the exact opposite. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, flip over to chapter 3. And we'll see that exact concept spelled out here. Verse number 18, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 18, the Bible says, Let no man deceive himself if any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world. Someone thinks they're really smart. Someone, so if one of you seems to be really wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. And what that means is let him become a fool in the eyes of the world. In order to achieve true wisdom, knowledge of truth, of things that actually are the way they are, to understand right and wrong and truth versus lies. You have to humble yourself and be viewed as a fool in the eyes of the world in order to receive the truth from God and God's word. Because the world's going to say you're a fool for believing the Bible. A fool for believing in the Lord and that this book actually has the truth. But this book does have the truth. God's word is truth. How else are you going to gain wisdom but through the truth? Jesus Christ said, I am the truth, the way and the life. Verse number 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Let's go back to, to Psalm 14 real quick. We're going to look at verse number 2. And then we're going to flip over to Romans 3. So Psalm 14, let's look at verse number 2. 
The Bible says the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And if that phrase sounds familiar, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. It's something that we typically use out soul winning all the time to show people that they're sinners, that we're all imperfect, that we all have sinned. And we get that from Romans chapter 3, which is quoting Psalm 14 right here. I'll reread Psalm 14. You turn, if you would, to Romans 3, where the Bible says, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men. When it's talking about the children of men, it's talking about unbelievers, not children of God, children of men. The Lord looks down, he looks down on the children of men to see if there's any that did understand and seek God. He said, they don't understand. Which is why we need preachers sent to preach the word of God and to give us the truth. That's why. Because left to ourselves, we don't know God. We need somebody to, to show us and to help us to understand God from God's word. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. The children of men are filthy in God's eyes because they are sinners. It says, There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And again, becoming a fool in the world's eyes. The world says, Oh, I do good. Not according to God. If you're, if you're an unbeliever, you don't. You may think that you do, but you don't. The Bible says that it's impossible to please him unless you have faith in him. About, you, know, you, you can't go to God unless you believe that he is God and that it's impossible to please him. And that's in Hebrews, and I don't have the reference in front of me right now, but we're turning to Romans chapter 3. We're going to start reading in verse number 8. The Bible says, And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. So he's saying, you know, that we, said we as Jews are not better than they as Gentiles. He's saying one is not better than the other. Because we're all under sin. We're all sinners. And then he quotes from Psalm 14, verse number 10, as it is written. That means he's quoting the Old Testament. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And I brought this up last Sunday when I preached on, on, um, or on Easter Sunday. And we, we preach, I preached about the deity of Jesus Christ in that passage where the, the rich young ruler, ruler comes over and says, Good master, what, must I do? What, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Or something along those lines. He says, uh, Good master. And Jesus said, Well, why, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that's God. And that's one more evidence that we know that Jesus is God because Jesus is good. Jesus was good. Jesus did not sin. So, of course, he was good. But we, because we have transgressed God's law, because we are sinners, we are not good in God's eyes. Which is why we need to be forgiven. And when we're washed away, then we become good. We receive the righteousness of Christ. It's imputed unto us. And then we can be seen by God as good because our transgressions have been washed away. But look at, this is interesting, and I, want, and I want to take time to point this out because Romans 3 continues on. That's the quote. The quote from, from Psalm 14 ends right there in verse number um, 12. But then he continues on and says, Their throat is an open sepulcher, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God 
before their eyes. And when I read this, this sounds more to me like a reprobate than it does just about your average unbeliever. And you notice in the context of Psalm 14, it also says, you know, that these are the people that they don't believe that there's God. They're not just an unbeliever, but then it continues on. And we're going to see when we go back to Psalm 14, in verse number 4, the Bible says, Of all the workers of iniquity, no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord. So it's talking about, about people who are eating up God's people, who are persecuting and destroying and just have a hatred for God's people and going after them. Then it says in verse 5, Then were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. And it's talking about the, the workers of iniquity being in great fear. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 1. I just wanted to point that out there, that when we see the context of Romans 3 and the, and the verses that come after the quote, and then we see Psalm 14, that it still kind of lines up. And, it, and it's very interesting that, that the people that it's talking to there. But I also want to point this out about this great fear, because Proverbs 1 also is very similar in the context that is, surrounds Romans 3 as well as Psalm 14. Proverbs chapter 1. Remember, Psalm 14 started off with the fool that said in his heart, there is no God. Talking about who a fool is. And in Proverbs chapter 1, it's the book of wisdom trying to give us wisdom, right? The opposite of fool is someone who's wise. And in Proverbs 1, we're going to start reading verse number 20. The Bible reads, Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. Hey, wisdom wants to be heard. Wisdom is available. It's there. It's crying aloud. Wisdom wants, wants to be known to everybody. Verse number 21, She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her word, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in her scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Why do you think atheists hate Christianity? Because they hate knowledge. Because they're fools. They don't like real knowledge. But let's continue reading here. Because God wants the atheist to get saved just as much as everybody else. So wisdom cries in the street. Wisdom is being shouted by the preachers, by the preachers of righteousness, by the people who are preaching God's word. Wisdom is being given. Verse number 23, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you, unto you. I will make known my words unto you. But now look at verse number 24. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. He's saying you rejected me. I tried to help you. I tried to call unto you, but you rejected me. Verse number 25. But you have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. You thought they were foolish. You thought it was stupid. You didn't want to have anything to do with it. So we'll see what happens with God. Verse number 26. I also will laugh at your calamity when things are going wrong. I will mock when your fear cometh because you will get afraid. The atheist always gets afraid and it's funny how many atheists will pray unto God when fear comes into their life because they're about to die or something like that. It's amazing how quick they'll acknowledge that God exists. But also notice we're looking at Proverbs 1. We were looking at Romans 3 that gives a lot of strong indication about the reprobate and about the, the throat being an open sepulcher, just being full of death. And then we looked at Romans 1. Romans 1 talks about the people who knew God, glorified them not of God, as God, and professing themselves to be wise and became fools. And they think they're so lifted up in themselves. And they worship and serve the creature more than the Creator. And then we go back to Psalm 14 and we see very sim a lot of similarities between all of these passages. And then even again here in Proverbs 1, where he says, hey, I tried to call unto you, but you refused. You didn't want to hear it. So you know what? Now when your, when your hard times come, when your fear cometh, as it said in verse 5 of Psalm 14, there were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. 
I will mock when your fear cometh. Proverbs 1, look at verse number 27. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. Sounds like the reprobate. You've rejected me. Now I'm rejecting you. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. The fools. The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. And you know what? In the world, they will be prosperous in the sense of they'll have a lot of money probably. And, and you'll see a lot of these, these so-called great minds and they have so much money and, and we can look up to them. The world wants you to look up to them. Well, that's going to destroy many people. The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Let's go back to Psalm 14. We're almost done. Psalm 14, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor because the Lord is his refuge. Shaming the counsel of the poor. And this is referring to the poor receiving counsel from the Lord. And the people who don't believe in God, they're shaming God in that sense. They're shaming the counsel of the poor because the Lord is his refuge. They're shaming the poor people. Oh, you're trusting in God? Where is your God? Oh, you're so poor. Where is your God? They're, again, just showing their own foolishness and lack of understanding and lack of knowledge. And if you think that the riches of this world is, is winning in life, then you are a fool because it's not about the money at all. Not even a little bit. Verse number seven. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. We have a prophetic statement here in that last verse. The salvation of Israel. What is the salvation of Israel? It's referring to Jesus Christ. The salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people. Now, some people might look at this and think this is just talking about the Jews. Right? The Zionists want to say, oh yeah, this is talking about the Jews. And that the, when the salvation of Israel comes, did you see all Israel is going to be saved. And, and they think it's just talking about this physical seed of Abraham or the physical seed of Jacob. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. Now, there was a captivity of the physical people in the Old Testament after this psalm was written. But that's not what this verse is referring to. Because what this verse is referring to is the deliverer. That the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. This is talking about Jesus Christ coming out of the heavenly Jerusalem or the heavenly Zion. Zion is the city of David, which is Jerusalem. The, the word captivity is interesting. You know, there's a lot of verses... Uh, people sometimes have a hard time talking about, you know, where Jesus Christ says he led captivity captive and basically um, took captivity, right, which, which could be death or hell and took that captive and turned the tables on captivity and took captivity captive. And um, here, this isn't talking about taking captivity captive, but it's just talking about God's people being brought out of captivity, now, another word for captivity would be like bondage. But the word captivity can also even be used for persecution. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, Job 42.10, the Bible says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Job was going through all kinds of afflictions. He was being afflicted of Satan. And in a sense, he was being, you know, kind of in bondage, but it wasn't to his own sin. He wasn't brought into bondage of sin, you know, because oftentimes when we think of being in bondage, we think of being in bondage to sin. And, and, and that is a common theme throughout the Bible. 
but this word captivity could be used. I mean, you're just, you're just being, you know, either in bondage or, or possibly even being suffering persecution as Job has. And what we see here, the salvation of it being saved, God's people being saved. When the Lord brings back the captivity of his people, it says, Jacob shall rejoice, Israel shall be glad. It's going to be happy when the captivity is brought back. And I believe that the captivity being talked about here, and you can apply, I think you can apply this in a few different ways, but the tribulation of his people is being brought back when the salvation of Israel or Jesus Christ comes out of Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. And what we need to understand while I was talking about, you know, the, the Zionists want to just apply this completely to the Jews, the physical Jews. Well, God's people being referred to as Israel in the Old Testament makes sense. But what we understand in the New Testament is that God's people isn't just um, solely dedicated to some physical seed because just as much as this world's not about making money, God's people is not just about who your ancestry is from and where your genealogy exists. That's not what makes you one of God's people. The Bible says in Romans 9, verse number 6, not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. The Bible says according to God, in God's eyes, when he's talking about Israel, who he considers to be Israel, it's not all the people who are of, like physically descended of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. That doesn't make them a child. That doesn't make them a child of God or a child of Abraham, even though they physically have descended from Abraham. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is referring to, what is he talking about? Why is Isaac important? Because they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. They are not God's people. They are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. That's what he meant all along and the new testament reveals that the new testament shines a light on that romans 9 galatians 3 romans 9 romans 10 romans 8 it all shines a light on what the bible's talking about here about the elect or god's people so when we read the bible talking about israel rejoicing and J J israel being glad or jacob rejoicing it's God's people, believers, those who are saved, rejoicing because God has brought back their captivity when the salvation of Israel, Jesus Christ, comes out of Zion. And how are they being captive if they're already saved? Well, they're not, they're not necessarily in, in bondage to sin, but they could be being persecuted as Job was when Job's captivity was, was turned when Job went through all of that massive persecution of the devil, well, during the tribulation period, the Antichrist, under the power of Satan, is going to be persecuting Christians until Jesus Christ comes back. The salvation of Israel is going to come and turn that captivity of the devil. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for these great psalms, these great songs in your word that are just packed full of doctrine, Lord. We love you. We thank you for, for teaching us. I pray that you please help us to, um, to be wise and that we don't care about what the world thinks. If the world thinks we're foolish, so be it, dear Lord. But we are going to use the foolishness of preaching to try to get through to those that will believe. And the world be damned. But we're going to try to reach those that will believe, dear Lord, and, and I pray that under your power and guidance and instruction, we, could, we can preach your word to the lost, and, and it's not about us, so we don't care if we're mocked or ridiculed. It's about you. It's about your word. It's about Jesus Christ, and it's about just trying to get people saved, dear Lord. Help us to remain humble and to uh, be able to not be ashamed at your words or for believing in your words, and that we would boldly proclaim them. We just ask for your boldness and your spirit to be upon us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.